Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to Auto Transport Intel. It is Wednesday. It is noon. That means it is time for DOT compliance with your DOT guy, Brian Riker. I'm Jay. I'm your host. This is the Car Shipping Business Channel. Do me a favor. Please do leave a like. Thank you so much. Right below the video, you see the share, copy, buttons, click them. Text it, email it, share it on social media, send it to a friend, get on the podcast. I'll share the link to that later. Jump in the live chat. We've only got 30 minutes, so we got to get right down to it. What's going to happen is, in a second, I'm going to bring in Brian. He is an FMCSA expert. He has a business, Fleet Compliance Solutions. I say expert that way because while we're providing advice, you can't take this as legal advice, but the best advice you can get on YouTube live on a Wednesday, maybe anywhere. But I don't know. We're going to check in with Brian. Let's just do that. Brian, can you see me and hear me okay? Yes, I can, Jay. Good afternoon. All right. Good afternoon. So so did I get that right? Am I close? Yes. Yes, you are. That's a good way to put it uh, because I am not an attorney, although I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. <laughs> so, so that almost qualifies. Yes. But seriously, the advice we give walks the line of legal advice. But as with anything, you should check with an attorney if you have any doubts about what is going on. Right. Or in this case, um, I'm going to share the link. So now you can go to yourdotguy.com. Yes, right? sir. Which will take you to fleetcompliancesolutions.net. I just put that into the live chat, so there's that. Um, and also, uh, let's see. Oh, and here's what I want to share. If you have a question, if you miss this show, you're on demand. You got to reach Brian. I just put it in the live chat. You want to email on air at yourdotguy.com. That should show up in the live chat here any second. There it is. On Perfect. air at yourdotguy.com. Because if you write, if you leave a message in the general mailbox, it may not get there right away. But this way now, or if you're live, right, go ahead and put it in the live chat right now and ask your question. Actually, two bears, he beat me to it. How do y'all, <laughs> as a singer, owner, operator, singer, owner, operator, that's, that's me, an excellent me. category. There we go. Me, me, me. Okay. As a singer, owner, operator, once you register with the clearinghouse, do you have to do anything further each year? Great question. Yes, Dave. Yes, you do. You still have to run a limited query on yourself every year uh, on or before the anniversary of when you ran your previous query. So if you ran it back in January when we all had to sign up, by the beginning of January this year, you'll run a limited query, not a full query anymore because you're still employed. It, it, it's kind of ridiculous because you'll know if you had a, a hot drug test, you'll know if your consortium reported it, but you still have to run it. Now, the good news about running it like that is if something mistakenly got attached to your uh, CDL number and reported, then you can figure out what went wrong and have your record corrected. But yes, whether you have one or a thousand drivers, the compliance with the clearinghouse portal is the same. Now you, so, yeah. you don't do anything with your driver's side okay. because you need to give yourself permission to run the limited query. But on the motor carrier side of the portal, you'll run a limited query for yourself every year. So I got to tell you, okay, so I'm up here. Let's say, you know, I'm brand new. I got to run a query. So first to do anything, I need to register right correct click register put in the information and that will create an account correct okay it, it will ask you if you're an owner operator and if you are a one truck owner operator or even if you're a multiple truck but you still drive as the owner you have to click owner operator when you're creating your account it's one of the questions they'll ask you and then that will direct you to also create a employer account separate from your driver account every cdl driver needs a clearinghouse account so they can give their employer permission to do that full query at uh, when they change employers or are looking for a job 
And then every employer needs a clearinghouse account. And technically, you employ yourself when you're an owner operator. You need a clearinghouse account so that you can do your query every year on whoever's driving your trucks. And so you're saying, are you saying then if I'm an owner operator, I'm the driver, I'm the owner, I need two separate accounts? Yes, you need to be the driver and you need to be employer. Now, if you're a single truck owner operator, there is an option that they combine them together, but they have two distinct functions. Ah, All, okay. all practical purposes, they are two separate accounts. So I could have a single account with two verticals? Yeah, there you go. You you yeah. like words, so yeah. I know. Okay. All right. Fair enough. I got to go. Jay, we haul like, cars horizontally on the trail. Somebody's like, just get to the point, Jay. Okay. So how now that I've got an account, how do I query myself? Which you would you would log in as the employer, and then there's a tab up at the top that will say uh, query a driver, and uh, you won't find it on this screen because you actually okay. create the account. So got to be in it. Okay. Into your employer portal. Then there'll be a query a driver. You can either enter the CDL number manually, or if I remember right, it brings down a list of who you have as drivers. And you have to have purchased a query plan, so Ooh. you can pay for it. And you can buy them one at a time or bundles. Um, and so you'll click the list, you'll click the driver you want, you'll pay for it. And then you will, it'll return the results almost instantly. Right, which is really what the clearinghouse is really all about, am I right? Is that this is finally an attempt to, so there's not some fax that fell under a desk in the somewhere, you know, in the backwoods. Well, the, this, right? will, this, this will address a lot of problems because once it's been in effect for three years, the employers will no longer need to send that fax to a previous employer to verify someone's safety performance history. Plus, we have a very, we do not have a prob big problem with drug and alcohol abuse in the trucking industry, but we do have a problem with it. Uh, so this will help catch a lot of that because no longer will you be able to fail a pre-employment drug test and then just not tell the next employer that, hey, I went over to Swift Trucking and I failed their pre-employment, but I waited a couple of weeks till I'm clean. Now I want to work for you. That pre-employment failure even will end up in this clearinghouse and you'll have to complete the return to duty test before you do any driving with your CDL. So this prevents the guys that try to stay one step ahead of that positive drug test by they show up because they have to, they pee, but they know they're going to pee hot. And so then they just quit their job that day and go work for another company and they're good. So they, they get some synthetic or they wait until their system's clear for a couple of days and go take that pre-employment somewhere else. And they don't have a big gap in employment history. They look good. You drivers quit every day. And so we don't even question why they quit a company anymore, but this is designed to prevent that from happening. The job hopping to avoid your positive drug test history following you i uh, just i just had four monsters and some golden seal you got an application okay so um john says oh he's okay he's good good morning from john he's in michigan uh lorena for cars to go to baltimore so he's giving us an update on his route good john keep us posted glad to hear it rob says okay how hard is it to add a broker's license or endorsement to your mc number it's not difficult. You would have to complete the application just like you did to get your MC number. Uh, you pay the fee to FMCSA, but you go to the same portal that if you were to self-serve and get your uh, DOT and MC number, you go to the same place, the FMCSA uh, website registration tab, and then apply for broker authority. Um, the process is very similar to applying for your DOT number. You will apply for broker authority, submit proof of your $75,000 surety bond, and then there's a public comment period, and then they issue it to you. It's attached to your same MC number if you're already a trucking company, and they'll update where you go into Safer and search yourself. It'll now say carrier broker at the top instead of just carrier. 
So it's really a very simple process to add broker authority or to get brand new broker authority. It, it's no more difficult than getting a US DOT number. And what I did was I just put up the screen. So I'm assuming, tell me if I'm right. So this is done at the FMCSA website Correct. under a broker registration. And it's probably right in there what you just said. Correct. It's $300 processing fee. It takes four to six weeks for them to process. It's very similar to DOT number. Generally, it processes on the short end of that four weeks. Uh, and if you're an existing motor carrier, you can use the legacy system, which I like because it doesn't ask you all the uh, all the uh, repetitive questions because it presumes you know what you're doing when you put the info in. But for someone that doesn't process these every day, I suggest using their regular registration portal and answering all the questions where it asks you the same question four different ways to make sure you are answering it properly. Big dogs eat. I didn't register for the clearinghouse when I first started my business last year. Now the FMCA is now the FMCSA is asking for pre-employment tests and stuff. What do I do? Could you repeat that question, Jay? I'm sorry. Yeah, it is a good question. All right, big dogs eat. I did not register for the clearinghouse when I first started my business last year. Now the FMCSA is asking for pre-employment tests and stuff. What should I do? So I'm, I'm going to assume that he's in the middle of the new entrant audit process. Um, if you're operating CDL trucks, you're, you're in a bind because failure to have a compliant drug testing program is one of the, uh, I call them the 16 deadly sins in trucking. It's one of 16 actions that can result in immediate revocation of your operating authority if you're running CDL required vehicles without being compliant. So if you started your company last year and you've been running CDL required trucks, then you're in trouble. You need to get a pre-employment test immediately. You need to contact your, your local field agent uh, agent office for FMCSA and see how they want you to handle it. Um, now, if you're running non-CDL trucks and you got just a standard form letter that comes with the offsite uh, new entrant audit, then you just uh, write a, a note in the packet of paperwork you send them that says we do not operate CDL required vehicles. So even if you physically have a CDL, but your trucks are non CDL, then the drug testing requirement does not apply to you. I would need a little more information to give you a binding answer. But in general, that is the way this process works. So what I'm thinking, um, because yeah, there's, I suppose, at one end, with you said 16 deadly sins yes all right um so we might be in a sin here in which case we can't turn back the clock but seeking professional help might alleviate something yes with right. fmcsa during the new entrant audit their goal is not to put you out of business their goal is to educate you and correct your behavior so you are compliant. So if they discover this uh, themselves and you're trying to hide it, then they do get nasty. But when you work with them to, okay, well, I messed up this requirement. I know I'm in trouble. How do we fix this? Uh, that is the appropriate way to go with it. Don't try to get a pre-employment test and, and alter the paperwork or, or something like that, because now that's fraudulent. Now you're talking severe fines, loss of your operating authority certificate, not good at all. But an honest mistake, they're more likely to work with you. Now, I'll be truthful, you're probably going to face some sort of monetary penalty from them right. as well. They're not as brutal as the IRS for paperwork mistakes, but there still may be a monetary penalty for failure to have a compliant drug testing program. Uh, or clearinghouse uh, documentation if it's required for your company. So what I did was, and I put it in the live chat, Brian's company is Fleet Compliance Solutions, LLC. Go to fleetcompliancesolutions.net. Personally, my thought is contact Brian, state the facts, and see where you're at and what you need to do next. Right? Sure, because... Each case is unique. 
and I can't give binding advice over a exactly. call-in show. If you retain me as your representation, then there's a lot more areas I can help you with and give you accurate binding advice. Also, suppose you are required to comply with the drug testing rules, but maybe you were fortunate enough that you worked for another legitimate motor carrier before you started yours that had you in a random pool if there's less than 30 days in between so there are some loopholes that will allow you to skip the pre-employment test because you had been in a program depends on when the last time is you were tested if that employer would be willing to share the record with you that you had been tested etc so there may be a very limited window where you're not actually in violation for not having a pre-employment you would just be in violation for not having a continuing consortium program to put you in a random pool. So I need a lot more information to, to accurately answer this question. Jason's got a great question. Is CSA score the same as DOT score? Yes, there there is no DOT score, if you will. The Department of Transportation administers the compliance safety and accountability program that's what csa is and that is where they store all of your activity it's uh, tied in the safer and a couple others it's where the motor carrier and the driver's inspection and per safety performance history records are stored yeah so you just said the safer and i want to bring that up here um because I know that, so when I'm dispatching for carriers, I've learned that uh, Safer Sys, is it? Safer Sys? Yes. Uh, safer, safer Web. I knew there was another name for it, but we call it Safer Sys. Well, that's the, the old link. That's the old web URL was safersys.org. Oh, it was. They've changed the safer. URL. Safety and Fitness Electronic Records System, therefore yes. Safer. Okay. So they I love just, their acronyms. Oh, yeah. And when they're really good? Oh. Okay, so um, I just put the links to that. CSA information, safer web information. And basically, this is where, um, and I'm just expounding at this point, Jason, but great question. Thank you for that. Is that if you're, if you're listening and you want to know more about what CSA stands for, CSA, is that commercial? What does CSA stand for? Compliance, Safety, and Accountability Program. Compliance, okay. Which essentially is your grade. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm treading on thin ice because I'm talking to an expert here. But it's your grade as a carrier of how you're doing. Yes. It, it's, it's, uh, it boils down into a score that we're not supposed to use publicly because it's flawed methodology but it's still used publicly by your insurance carriers and shippers that want to decide if they want to do business with you and brokers and everything else. But it's the best available information we have to determine how safe you are thought to be by enforcement based on your interactions with them. It details any time you've had a motor vehicle inspection interaction with a commercial vehicle officer and then they rank it based on the level of severity for your violations, how long ago the violation was, your size of fleet, so they compare you against similarly sized fleets, and then that's where they come up with their score. And then each of these seven basics, which are behavior, analytic, safety improvement categories, each of the seven basics has a threshold where if you're below that number, you're presumed to be safe, then you got to risky area and if you get above a certain number then you're presumed to be dangerous and the fmcsa can then intervene and send one of their agents into your business to tell you what you're doing wrong and make you create a corrective action plan excellent um by the way hey check this out uh okay i left you a message brian about the new entry audit and pre-employment test that's probably my phone that was ringing during this <laughs> that's awesome that's great man love that that's what this show is all about is connecting good information which is why perfect timing we love to go into uh we bet you can't stump brian if you've got some really hard question ask it here on uh dot compliance on wednesdays put it in the live chat send an email on air at your dot guy brian and uh wait a minute did i wait on air at your oh, your dot guy.com 
yourdotguybrian.com. Okay, how we doing? Perfect timing. Because your CSA score, this is before the score. Hopefully we mm-hmm. reach you before your how we do- doing turns into Carlos Danger. Yes. Exactly. That's the whole goal. So um, here's one for you. It, <laughs> do we have, are we, I don't know. That's, how we doing? Uh, wow. So for those of you in podcast landia that can't see the screen, we have a regular cab. Maybe F-250 at best. It's got eight lugs on the wheels. So an F-250, four four by four, single rear wheel with uh, off-road tires, not highway commercial truck tires. So I will almost guarantee that tire does not have the load rating for what you're hauling with a Kaufman two-car wedge, which in and of itself, if the truck was a little better equipped with tires, it, that I would be sure the right weight rating. Two cars on this wedge, not awful. We have uh, the guys in the middle of strapping the load down, so I can't critique how he has it loaded yet. You can see the driver is standing under the trailer. Looks like he's getting ready to put chains on the rear axle of uh, one of the vehicles. Maybe they're working on something on the truck. That I can't be sure. Now I'm looking at the way the rear car, it's an SUV on the rear, is strapped. One strap in the back through the rim, not my preferred method, but not illegal, just not industry standard. But now we've got a strap on the right front wheel that appears to be through the rim and up and over the tire. And I'm not sure what they're trying to accomplish there. It almost looks like it's hooked into the aluminum wheel spoke. Uh, Obviously, we have somebody here that is not familiar with industry standard under how to secure a vehicle. Um, But that's the biggest problem I see with this is how the vehicles are being secured, weight distribution, load distribution. You're pushing it with a uh, four-door Tacoma off-road package and a larger Honda SUV on this single rear wheel, short wheelbase truck. I I would say they're, they're really pushing the limits of that truck that's pulling it. I've seen worse. Uh, What also bothers me is I don't see a single name or DOT number on the side of the truck. So, and it doesn't look like it's been edited. So I'm assuming this is either a dealer hauling his own cars, a private guy that doesn't know any better, or one of the guys that's trying to run under the radar. And given the overall condition of this rig, I'm going to say it is definitely someone running under the radar. Doing not so well in this picture. All right, so I gave him the buzzer, but that's all I wanted. We're going to move on to the next one. I just wanted to get your impression. That was fantastic, Brian. I mean, and again, this is, if if we happen to rate your rig, (laughs) rate your rig here on DOT Plus. Yeah. Let's pause for one second, Jay. Because what I just did in the last 45 seconds is exactly what the motor carrier enforcement officer that's driving down the road or sitting in the scale house does. They grade you just that quickly on the couple of points I picked up. No DOT number. The way the straps are installed, the overall appearance of the rig, just the appearance that it looks like it could be overloaded, even if it isn't, is enough for them to stop you for further investigation. So I hate to say it because I'm not one that likes to dress fancy or anything like that, but your rig, the appearance is critical to your roadside safety score because that truck, if I was motor carrier enforcement, would definitely warrant a closer look and I would find a reason to initiate a traffic stop and investigate. Hey, here's a follow-up from Jason. Uh, Again, asking about the CSA score. Um, Jason had asked, yeah, CSA score. Okay, Jason adds, the reason he's asking is his insurance went up. They said his DOT score went up 18 points because of an accident June 30th. Totaled out my truck. Teenager crossed the line. He was at fault. Four injuries caused by other vehicle. Am I stuck with the points? Not necessarily. There is a procedure to challenge an accident. Because under current rules, any accident that involves a commercial motor vehicle goes on your uh, CSA score, your safety record. So I'm going to say your insurance company is using DOT because that's just the way they go it. 
uh, the, the way they particularly call it. And they're probably not using the same public portal, the CSA portal. They're probably using the cab card product because when you said went up 18 points, that's not the way we're scored with the official government website. So they're using a third party provider for that data, such as the cab card, which is industry standard. It's normal. It's accurate. But what we need to do is, again, I'll need the crash report and some more information on the crash. And it's not a free service, but I may be able to file a data queue or data quality challenge under a pilot program they have right now to remove certain classes of not at fault accidents that involve a commercial vehicle. So if the site, if the accident report clearly indicates that the other vehicle crossed the double yellow line and hit you head on, and we can make a determination that it was an unavoidable crash, then we may be able to get that removed from your record. That said, your insurance company is probably still going to consider it in your premium. It just may not pay uh, penalize you as much because it will still be a crash that is discoverable by the driver of that truck's motor vehicle record. But then it's explainable that you were not at fault. Someone hit you head on and blah, blah, blah. And we're, you know, I, I just want to add, I'm sorry that happened to you. Of course, um, that's the thing about trucking transport there's all these external factors that are just mm -hmm. so far out of the control um of of the business owner i just want to add that last night we had a great show beyond the fuel island and really what we're talking about is growing your business brian was there we had several experts lionel sue candy joe burkari if you missed the show last night beyond the fuel island I'm putting the link in the live chat. I think half the people in the live chat right now were there last night. Ding, ding. Thank you guys so much. But if you missed it, um, feel free to check that out. Also, don't forget to get signed up with the podcast. This podcast is growing. It's really, really neat. I'm very excited about that. Um, and we're, we only got a couple minutes left. So here's what we're going to do, Brian. We're going to do, we're going to finish up the how we doing. We didn't get to, um, will you start a trucking company with me? But we'll do that next time. Here's another how we doing. This was sent in. They were driving down the road, only could get some pictures. Okay, do you know why this is included? I'm not even sure what I'm looking at there because his right? window's pretty bad. Okay. See, yeah. I see we have a strap. A uh, ratchet with a finger hook into the deck and a strap heading forward somewhere. Oh, you know what? In his email, he I think he said there was only one strap, strapped one tire per car. <laughs> is I think what he said. That, that doesn't even come close to meeting the vehicle securement standard found in 49 CFR um, 393, 128. That doesn't even come close to that. Uh, industry standard is four points of tie down all four corners minimum by federal regulation is two and the way to be effective for what they want forward backward up and down is two opposite corners but when you're only using two you also have to make sure that the straps have enough rating to secure the the static weight of that vehicle or 50% of the static weight of that vehicle. So the little blue hatchback up top is probably a 2,800 pound car. So between his two straps, he needs 1,400 pounds. He probably has that with those straps. But when you get into some of the bigger uh, vehicles or you get into some of the low price straps, they can be rated anywhere from 3,333 pounds up to 4,700 pounds for a wheel strap. Look identical physically, but they have a different rating. And if you get a real sharp eyed or very particular motor carrier enforcement officer, he will look for that rating tag on your strap. If he can't find the rating tag, he's going to presume it's the lower rating as allowed. And, but yeah, this, this whole picture here, two cars on a wedge and two straps pulling up the hill is all that I can see. That is not right. Not right at all. And here's another look. So if we, I mean, really... <laughs> There is one strap in this picture. It should be called Find the Strap. And guys, this is what causes us problems because the insurance company does not see any difference between this guy going out and cutting corners 
and the guy that has the same piece of equipment but does it perfectly legitimately. Um, can't see anything here, but uh, but you should be able to see a strap in this picture, even with the silhouette. Yes, you even with even with the shading, we should be able to see something. Um. So yeah, yeah. And so we'll stop there. We will pick up next time with Will You Start a Trucking Company with Me? Oh, joy. <laughs> yeah, we had some of those questions that we didn't get to last night. So I know. Week. Yeah, no, there was some. And, and, I'm, and I am sorry that we didn't get to. Well, I was racing through. That's the thing. Last night, I, I mean, clearly I bit off more than I can chew. But where do you start? Uh, about 20 minutes into your monologue in the beginning cut your monologue short dude <laughs> but no seriously so my mono yeah well uh, this, this could be a whole series of videos it really could there's a I know. so we got to work on that so so we will be working on that in the coming weeks awesome all right hey i think this was a really great show solid information thank you all so much for jumping into the live chat asking your questions participating in the show if you need help contact brian i put the uh, link it is fleet compliance solutions.net brian oh and hey brian bad news we don't have a show next week we don't no i'm sorry you, you gotta stop taking vacation no it's not a vacation i got preempted i've got another special live event and they wanted the noon i don't know they they wanted Wednesday. They were dead set on Wednesday. And so they're taking the noon time. And so, oh, what can I do? That That's fine. <laughs> so um, so you get the week off next Wednesday. Um, we'll be back in two weeks. So that will be the first Wednesday in October. That is October 6th. Wait, which I'll be in Chattanooga, Tennessee at a trade show. But I... We'll carve out some time for our audience. But you know, and Ty is going to be live in Detroit. So we, we'll we have to see. I don't know. Yeah, you, you figure it out. You're the producer. Are you, uh, I wonder if there's a way to, maybe we, we, what if we rope you in? We might rope you in. Sure. Does that do, um, do OEMs and tier one, does that interest you at all? I have some experience with them, and I, I do read Automotive Logistics Magazine every month, so I'm cool. Me too. Things. Well, maybe we'll rope you in on October 6th. I'll put that on my notes. We'll, we'll, we'll figure that out when it comes. And All right, everybody, we'll miss you next week, but we'll be yes. back. Thank you so much, Brian. Take care, everybody. Thanks. See you. Bye.